You're muted. How about now? You guys can hear me now? Okay. All right. Well, glad to see you guys back. And like I was saying, Alex, I thought for a moment you were going to get to be the sole audience for uh, this last chapter. All right. Well, I hope everyone had a good uh, holiday. Um, this obviously will be the last lecture be chapter 15 it's a very short chapter and so all the other uh meetings will be set up as, as study days study sessions and that again gives you opportunity to come in i'll be here the regular time if you have any questions we can go over any of the problems you want um, also remember that i, I did uh, on the website and i believe in the module the last module I gave you a PDF on an, an, a, a final exam, practice exam, an idea of what, what, to, what to see with respect to the final. 60 questions and almost, uh, I think, an hour, 50 minute time limit. Um, I cannot, it, it's going to be given on the 14th. That is our last official day. If that day doesn't work for you, then I, I can give you day before or a couple of days before. So if the 14th doesn't work out for you for whatever reason, let me know and we'll make arrangements to make sure you can take it ahead of the time. Okay. Any questions? No? All right. Well let us jump in and knock out this last one here. So like I stated, it's a very short chapter. It deals with solutions. So now, basically, what, how do we define a solution? In a solution, we have two, well, we have multiple components, but the two main components are these, a sol solute, U-T-E, and a solvent, okay? Now, the solute is what is dissolved in the solvent and generally is in a much smaller quantity, okay? Most of the time uh, we do, when we talk about solutions, we, we're using aqueous systems, but you know, you can have a solution that is not aqueous. Um, you can have an oil-based solution, quite readily have one. The main aspect about this is that, keep this in mind, light dissolves light. So we talked about polar molecules. Okay, so polar molecules will dissolve in polar solids. And the converse is also true. Nonpolar compounds will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. Okay. Obviously, we know that we can't, you know, a good example of something that doesn't dissolve is Italian dressing. Italian dressing has two layers. If you ever look at it, you got an oil layer and a water layer, aqueous layer. As we as you should know by now, the oil is a nonpolar solvent. Whereas the water, the aqueous system is polar. Those two do not mix. Okay. Concentration. That's just a function of the amount of solute that you have in a solvent. Uh, so this colored, uh, this could be, you know, Kool-Aid, for example. So you can see quite, quite drastically in the far left, you got a light pink color that's not as concentrated, obviously, as the glass in the far right, which obviously contains more solute, gives you a stronger color, okay? So a strong solution is considered to be more concentrated, more sol solute. Okay. So we, we tend to think about solutions with respect to liquids, but that's not the case. You could have a, um, alternative physical stage to give you a solution. For example, you can have a gas in a liquid. Classic example is a carbonated drink, okay? A soda, we have gas that's been dissolved in, in a liquid. You can have a liquid in a liquid. That's the most obvious one that we, we're probably familiar with. 
and also more familiar with solid and liquid. But in this case, we got a liquid and a liquid. You can make, for example, a mixed drink or iced tea or anything like that because that's a solution. Solid in a liquid, that could be a solid material like uh, sodium chloride, which we know anything that is soluble, but as defined by the solubility rules would make a, an example of a solid in a liquid solution and the liquid being aqueous. We can have a gas in a gas. In other words, the air around us is a mixture of a variety of different gases, mostly nitrogen and oxygen, but we do have carbon dioxide out there. We got methane, we got a variety of different, different gases up in the air, okay? And then we don't think of this normally as a solution, but it is classified as a solution and that is a solid and a solid. For example, steel. Steel is a combination of iron and carbon. And that is done because pure iron in itself is not very strong. And so what happens is a little bit of uh, trace amount, not trace, could be, depends on the alloy, and an amount of carbon is placed into the steel. And that what that does changes the properties of the component of the material. And you make a solution of steel. Another example would be brass. Brass is a mixture of copper, which by itself is very soft, but you add a little zinc to it, plus some other metals, silver, and you know, trace amounts, you make a very hard metal like brass. Uh, gold, the, the jewelry that you're wearing, if you have any gold on you, um, is not pure gold. Uh, pure gold in itself, again, is very, very soft and would not function well in itself as a ring because it would readily, you know, smash and, and you pin, first time something hits your hand or your ring finger, it would just collapse in you. So it, they add other metals in there and that uh, changes the properties overall of the solution and makes them a little bit stronger, a little bit thicker, uh, stronger, I should say. Now, <laughs> recall as I said, like dissolves like. That's the basic rule. So if a polar solutes will dissolve in polar solvents, okay? Whereas nonpolar solutes dissolves in nonpolar solvents. Polar and nonpolar do not mix. So you can see by the picture here that we have oil and oil spill, which is a very nonpolar compound. And water obviously is very poor. The, the two were not mixed and we have a big mess, okay? So when we are dealing with liquids and liquids, when they do mix together, a liquid solute and a liquid solvent, we call that miscible. Those two solvents are miscible. When they do not mix, then they are classified as being immiscible. When we're dealing with liquid and liquid, okay? Miscible, immiscible. When we deal with a solid in a liquid, it's either gonna be soluble or insoluble. So uh, solid uh, dissolves in, in whatever liquid it may be, you know, then it's soluble. So, so it's a solid liquid combination compared to a liquid liquid combination. Uh, with respect to the solubility rules, again, uh, refresh your memory on those because when we're dealing with some solids, which are ionic compounds, okay? When ionic compounds are listed here, we use the solubility rules to determine whether it will dissolve in a, most of the time, in aqueous solution. All, all ionic compounds, here's something to remember, all ionic compounds will not dissolve at all in any nonpolar solid, okay? Ionic compounds will dissolve in water, an aqueous, a polar solvent. And if it's an aqueous, depending on the solubility rules, it will be either classified as soluble and insoluble, if you remember. But even when they are classified as insoluble, there's still a small amount of ionic compound that is in solution, okay? So, so what do we do here? Well, we got a table where on the first column you have the solvent, okay? And then across you have the solute, HCl, iodine, 
uh, trichlorophosphorus trichloride, and then CH4, which is methane. Well, in order for us to be able to answer whether the solute will dissolve in the solvent, we first have to define its polarity, okay? And so if we look at solvent, the first one, NH3, well, this, we've talked about this one quite a bit now. This is ammonia. And if we do the Lewis dot structure, we end up with a lone pair on the central atom, which is a nitrogen, okay? And each of those three bonds, hydrogen, nitrogen bonds, are polar bonds, and they don't uh, cancel each other out because there is a lone pair in um, the central atom, okay, to refresh your memory. Okay, we ended up with a structure of ammonia that looked like this. A Lewis dot structure, and we had lone pair on the central atom, okay? Now, normally we would think, okay, I got four species around the central atom, which would give us a, a tetrahedral configuration. And when you have polar bonds in the tetrahedral configuration, okay, then you end up with a nonpolar species because in this geometry, all the, non, all the polar bonds will cancel each other out. Okay, but what happens here, yes, we have a polar bond between each of the three nitrogen hydrogen bonds, but the lone pair of electrons cause this bond angle to decrease to be less than 109.5, which results in a polar molecule. Okay, polar molecule. Okay. The second one, C12H26. Now we may not know what it is, and that's okay. There's a multiple of potential compounds that could be C12H26, but that's not the important. What we need to recognize that we have nothing but carbon hydrogen bonds, that's it. And automatically, no question about it, we have a nonpolar solvent in this case. Okay, nonpolar because of the carbon hydrogen bond. And again, because of the carbon hydrogen bond, the, the electronegativity, the EN of the hydrogen and the carbon are essentially the same. Therefore, we end up with a nonpolar bond, which results in a nonpolar molecule, which in this case would be a nonpolar solvent. Okay. BR2, BR2, bromine, is diatomic. Remember, diatomic species are A bonded to A. The electronegativity of both of these that are bonded together is, are the same. And so, therefore, there's an equal sharing of that bond, equal sharing of this bond here, which results in a nonpolar species. So all diatomic compounds are nonpolar. Uh, all carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. Okay. And molecules that have polar bonds that cancel each other out, depending on their electronic configuration, are nonpolar. Okay. So we get refresher memory and all that we, that we talked about way back when. So in this case, H, uh, bromine is nonpolar. So now we have defined the polarity of the solvent. Now we're going to define the polarity of the solute. So we have hydrochloric acid. Now you might think, all right, HCl. I used the example before where I said A in general terms, A bonded to A is a nonpolar species simply because A and A are both the same element and therefore the electronegativity is the same, there's equal sharing, okay? Then I use the general form of AB, where B is a totally different atom, okay? With the exception of carbon hydrogen, because two different elements, so nonpolar, all AB configurations, two different elements automatically, we have a polar bond. 
or bond automatically simply because we have two different atoms, two different electronegativities. One of them is going to be greater than the other with respect to negativity, and we end up with a polar bond. And let's just say, for example, that B has higher electronegativity, so we have a dipole arrow going to B. Okay. So <laughs> we look at HCl. HCl, if we do the Lewis dot structure, we end up with a Lewis dot structure, which is linear, and we end up with these, this species right here, okay? Linear structure, two different, two different atoms, which is an AB example, which tells you we got a polar bond. It's linear, and it's not gonna cancel out, so we got a polar bond, and the arrow goes toward chloride, and how do I know that? Because the chloride is much closer to fluorine, Remember on the periodic table, fluorine is the most electronegative, most electronegative element. Okay, and so to determine the relative electronegativity of two different elements, we see how close they are to chloride, and chloride's way right below high. Uh, uh, excuse me right below uh, fluorine and hydrogen is way over in the far right of the periodic table. So obviously the chloride is a lot more electronegative and that's for the arrow that goes to the electron. So having worked through that, we conclude that HCl is polar, okay? I2 iodine, as we talked about, is a diatomic element, not element, di yeah. It is diatomic molecule of an element, so therefore it is nonpolar. PCL3, okay? Well, we may not know what it is, that's okay, but we know that phosphorus is the central atom. And that being the case, remember in general, 99% of the time, the first atom written is the central atom. We can do the Lewis dot structure. And if we do that, we end up with the following structure. Okay. Which is the AB3 general formula, AB3E. We got a lone pair sitting here. Yes, we got three polar bonds, but with that lone pair, again, it's, that's causing that bond angle to be less than 109.5. And that lone pair sitting there, as we talked about with ammonia, makes this PCL3 a polar molecule. Okay. So PCL3 is polar. Now CH4, as we went through the exercise with C12H26, nothing but carbon hydrogen bonds, automatically we have a nonpolar solute. So now that we have defined the polarity, now we can answer the question of which of the solutes dissolve in these solids. So if we have the combination between ammonia and H3 and HCl, the answer would be yes, because light dissolves like HCl is polar and H3 is also polar. The next example would be no, it wouldn't work. Iodine would not dissolve very well in NH3 because of I, I too, I didn't be nonpolar. PCL3 would dissolve because of the polarity, its polarity. And CH4, which is uh, methane, by the way, uh, would not dissolve again because we're de dealing with different polarities. Okay. For the next one, the, the hydrocarbon and HCl definitely would not. Again, difference in polarity. If iodine, it would dissolve iodine, but not a problem. Okay. Uh, P, uh, PCl3 would not dissolve. Again, difference in polarity, but it definitely will absorb and dissolve uh, some methane. Okay. Uh, bromine, as being the solvent, would not be able to dissolve any HCl because of difference in polarity but we can add a little iodine to a lot of bromine and it will dissolve, okay? Because they're both nonpolar. PCL3 will not dissolve because of the difference in polarity and methane will dissolve in that, okay? 
So the takeaway here, if you're ever given molecules and being asked the question, will this solute dissolve in this solvent? Well, to answer that question, you first have to determine the, sol the polarity of the solute and, and the solvent. And if they're both nonpolar, it will dissolve. If they're both polar, it will dissolve. If they're, one of them is different, there's going to be no, no dissolving occurring because of difference in polarity. All right. Now, with respect to uh, liquids and solids, we use the term when we're dealing with liquids, miscible and immiscible, and, and immiscible. And when we're dealing with solids and liquids, we're using the term uh, soluble or insoluble. Same, same scenario here. Like dissolves like, keep that in mind, okay? Polar liquid versus polar solvent. We, we will classify that as being immiscible because we're dealing with liquids in this case. It would be classified as immiscible if we're dealing with a polar liquid and a nonpolar solvent. Um, nonpolar liquid, polar solvent, immiscible. Nonpolar liquid and nonpolar solvent, immiscible. Okay, polar solid in a polar solvent will be classified as soluble because we're dealing with a solid and a liquid. And it will be classified as an insoluble if we're dealing with a, a polar sol solid and a nonpolar solvent. Okay, insoluble for a nonpolar solid and a polar solvent, and soluble for nonpolar solid and nonpolar solvent. Now they're telling you ionic uh, solid. Well, the question will be, check the solubility rules, okay? When we're dealing with an ionic compound, an ionic solid, we're gonna deal with most of the time an aqueous system. And then we check the solubility rules. If the solvent is nonpolar, it will totally be insoluble, okay? Try this at home. If next time you throw a little oil in a pan, throw in some table salt. The oil is nonpolar. The table salt is ionic. It's not going to dissolve. It will just sit there. Okay. Now try that with a little bit of warm water, you know, in the pan and throw in some table salt. It will go into solution. Okay. Because sodium chloride is solid. Um, <clears throat> So also they also I use I used to use makeup as as a as as an, an example too, but I think makeup now has changed so much. You know, I haven't, haven't kept up with the new stuff out there. But uh, I remember uh, growing up with five sisters that uh, in the evening when they're taking their makeup off, uh, <laughs> it was like Halloween every night because they would put on this uh, white material oil stuff or lotion or I don't know what it was to get that stuff off. Soap and water wouldn't take it off because soap and water is polar in the makeup they had was like hurricane proof. It won't come off with any water. So you got to use like, you know, 30 weight oil, to get that stuff off. Okay. And then some of the Halloween makeup, you know, any bit of water dissolves because there is some polar character to that makeup. All right. All right, well, the dissolving process, really not much to say here, okay? We have a, uh, a water most of the time, you know, we're dissolving, and it gets solvated by uh, the, the ionic compounds going in solution. So we have the sodium ion in solution with a full positive charge, and then the water molecules are kind of surrounding it, and they're interacting with the, the oxygen here, okay? So we had this interaction because it's partial negative of the polarity of water. Now, if this was sodium chloride, then the chloride would be on the other side, the ion, and that would be interacting with the, part, the positives, partial positives of the hydrogen. And so these ions would be totally solvated in water. In water. water is very unique in its properties. It's very interesting. Okay, now. Let's talk about concentration, okay? There's two types of concentration definitions that we're gonna utilize. 
one is called a mass percent, which is simply just the, the weight of the solute divided by the total weight of the solution, okay? The weight of the solute divided by the total weight of the solution. So the total weight of the solution involves the weight of the solvent and the weight of the, of the solute times 100, and that gives us a mass percent. Then we have another one called molarity. Here you thought we're gonna get rid of moles, huh? Well, here they come again. Molarity, and we kind of introduced this a while back when we were talking about pH. If you remember, we were talking about pH and we had that proton concentration and we had a bracket around it, remember that? And that was defined as the concentration with the capital M molarity. And that was simply defined as the, role, as the ratio of moles over volume, which in this case is the liters, okay? And so moles, remember how to calculate moles. Normally you start with grams and you divide by the molar mass. So to calculate moles, we're gonna need the uh, uh, molar mass of whatever compound we're looking at. And if we don't know what we have to, if they give us the name of the compound, then we have to take the name of the compound and determine the formula of the compound. Because now knowing the formula, we can actually calculate the molar mass, okay? All right, so mass percent. As, as I stated earlier, the mass percent by definition is simply the mass of the solute, okay? Divided by the mass of the solution. The solution is a total weight of the solvent and the solute, okay? The total weight. And then all that's multiplied by 100. So you end up with a, a percentage. Okay. So here we, we're being asked to calculate the mass percent of 15 grams of potassium nitrate dissolved in 135 grams of water, okay? Now, with the, with the mass percent, we don't have to know anything about the molar mass here, okay? All we need to know is how much of the solute, how much of the solvent. That's it. So 15 grams of the solute divided by the sum of the weight of the solute and the solvent, okay? So 135 plus 15, okay? And we take that and divide that by, uh, well, 15 divided by the sum of the weight. Same, the sum of the, of the weight of the solvent in the solute times 100. So in this particular example, it is a 10% solution, okay? 10% solution. You'll find out there when you buy, like for example, alcohols, beer, for example, they, they talk about well, how much percent alcohol. Most of the time, those are dealing with volume, volume, the volume of alcohol over the volume of your solution, okay? And sometimes there's a mass over volume. So sometimes there's a volume over volume times 100. Uh, so, but we can just deal with mass over mass, the mass percent. All right, now, if you are in the nursing profession, uh, you may have be familiar with a what's called a saline solution, okay? Which is nothing more than sodium chloride, okay? But it is a 0.09% mass percent, okay? And so that's what it is. And that, that percent is very, very important because if you inject pure water or too concentrated water, it will play a havoc on on the sound, so either will cause them to explode or cause them to shrivel up and implode. So uh, any solution that's going into our body, uh, we need to keep the salt concentration at, at a 0.9%, FYI. All right, so a lot of, like I said, most of the time, 
we are given the mass of the solvent and the mass of the solute. Occasionally, we're asked the question, all right, well, how many grams of water are needed to make a 5% solution, saline solution, with 10 grams of water? So you got 10 grams of water, and you need to figure out, okay, well, how much water do I need? How much water do I need to make sure that when I mix the, the, the 10 grams of water and, and 10 grams of salt and the water, I end up with a 5% solution. So we set this up mathematically as follows, okay? Now, this is probably gonna be the most complicated algebra you're ever gonna do for Chem 130. Okay, so we set the problem. We, realize, we know by definition, the, the solute is up here, 10 grams. So, and the solution is the weight of the solute and the weight of the solvent, okay? But we don't know what that is because that's what we're being asked to determine. And so we set that, we define that as X. So now we have an algebraic equation here. It's at 5%, okay? We're gonna multiply by all this by 100 to give us 5%. So we have to rearrange this equation to determine what X is because X is the amount of water that we need to take 10 grams of salt so we can make a 5% solution, okay? Now, this can be done as far as solving this equation any multiple ways. Algebra does offer multiple ways to solve this equation. So I'm just gonna use what their suggestion to do in the first step. So if they end up with step this step. And if you look at this, you're like, well, how did they get from step number one to step number two? Well, what they did was they took the quantity uh, 10.0 plus X on both sides of the equation. Oh, let me put it over here. 10.0 uh, plus X, okay? And so with that being the case, that denominator cancels out Okay, leaving us with 10 times 100, which is this. And then on the other side would be the 10 plus, uh, uh, 10 plus X quantity right there, times five, okay? Now, you can do this in multiple ways at this point, but what they did the next step was simply just multiplied 100 times 10 to give us 1,000, okay? Now, uh, this, this would be step number three. Number four is, well, they got, they went to this. Well, what they do here? Well, all they did was multiply everything by five. Okay, notice how five cancels over here, leaving us 10 plus X is equal to a thousand divided by five. Okay, and that's step number four. Then they went ahead and took a thousand and divided by five that gives you 200 and that's step number five. Now they solve for X. So now you can take X is equal to 10, 200 minus 10.0, okay? And I'm gonna add, do a negative 10.0 on both sides that cancels that out and you end up with 190. However, keeping track of sig figs, let me clear this up a little bit. We end up with 1.90 times 10 to the second, simply because we're dealing with three sig figs, okay? Our, our three sig figs are both in the 5.00 and at 10.0. So we have to carry through our sig figs and we can't write 190 like that with, in three sig figs because if you recall, if we add a decimal point, all right, we add a decimal point, 
Yeah, yeah, you could have done hit this point. You now that zero becomes significant. That would have been okay. I would I would accept that. Okay. Uh, but not if you add a decimal point in zero because now you got four sig figs. So that that wouldn't work. Okay. But when in doubt, you put them into scientific notation and then there's no question whatsoever. Okay. The so 1.90 times 10 to the second grams. That's how many grams you need of water to make a 10% solution. So what do you do to, to make sure that is correct? Well, you take it and you plug it back in there. Okay, X is equal to 190, plug it in and do the math you should end up with 5.00 is equal to 5.00, which is a true statement. 5.00 equals 5.00, which means that 190 is the correct answer. Okay. All right, with respect to molarity, as I stated, it is the ratio of moles over liter. So we need to calculate how many moles. And the, the volume could, if it's given to milliliters, then you simply convert that to liters because we know that there's 1,000 milliliters in one liter, okay? So for example, calculate the molarity if 9.99, 9.99 grams of potassium bromide is dissolved in water to make two and a half liters of solution. Well, before we even do anything, we have to determine the formula. Okay, so this brings us to that chapter when we're writing, writing formulas, right? Remember I suggest you're given the name so potassium bromide, which is an ionic compound. So that means you're dealing with ions here. So write the ions. And we have potassium, which is the symbol K. Potassium is in group one metal. So when it becomes ionic, it would have a plus one charge. Bromide is a group seven nonmetal. And when it becomes an ion, it would be a negative one charge because it will pick up one electron. It is a non-metal. So those are the ions and they're simply, I can put them together as a one-to-one -one basis because uh, the charges cancel each other out. So that is the formula for potassium bromide. Once I know that, I look up the atomic weight for potassium, the atomic weight for bromide, that gives me the molar mass, okay? Once I know the molar mass, I can now calculate the number of moles in 9.99 grams of potassium bromide. And so the first step is, and clear my mess here, is follows, is we have 9.99 grams of potassium bromide. Its molar mass is 119. Remember, I got grams, I only get two moles. Notice my grams cancel out. So I got moles in the numerator. So I have, 0.08395 moles. Don't truncate anything, don't round anything until the end. You can see that uh, I have nine sig figs in 9.99 and three, excuse me, <laughs> three sig figs in 9.99 and three sig figs in 2.50. So my answer will end up with three sig figs, all right? So don't truncate anything until you're done with all your calculations. So you use all the numbers, divide that by 2.25. And now at this point, truncated, as we've been doing before with respect to rounding up or down, depending on the neighbor adjacent to that number that I'm gonna either round up or leave the same, okay? And so my answer is 0 0.036 moles per liter. So if I take out, if I weigh out 9.99, 9.99 grams of potassium bromide, and I take two and a half liters of solution water, I mix them up, my concentration 
would have would be 0 0.0336 molar or moles per liter. Okay. Let's do one more. Okay. Calculate mo, uh, mo, uh, the molarity if you take five grams of sodium phosphate and I dissolve it in 255 milliliters. Now remember, molarity is moles per liter, okay? And so I'm gonna need a couple of conversion factors. But before I go any further, I need the molar mass of sodium phosphate. Well, I need to find out what the formula is. So again, we have, we're dealing with ionic compounds. Sodium is a plus one, it's, a, it's in group one, is a plus one ion. Phosphate, A-T-E, that should direct you to the polyatomic table on the periodic table, okay? And you should come, if you look that up, you got PO4 negative three, okay? Or the phosphate ion which means that I'm gonna need three sodiums for every phosphate ion, okay? Because each sodium is a plus one and the phosphate ion is a negative three. So therefore my formula would be Na3PO4. That would be my formula. Now I, I, I add up the quantity of sodium, the, the atomic weight of sodium times three, atomic weight of phosphorus, Okay, atomic weight of oxygen times four, sum that up, that is the molar mass for sodium phosphate. Okay. And that should end up, that would end up to be 163.94 grams. Okay, so 5.0 grams divided by 163.94, will give me 0 0.0309. Again, we keep all the digits until the end of the, of the calculation. We got three sig figs here and two sig figs there. So our final answer should end up with two sig figs, okay? So we keep these numbers there until we're done. Now we're gonna take the two, 255 milliliters and we're gonna convert that two liters, okay? And we use a conversion factor of one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. Notice my units setting that up, okay? My milliliters cancel, leaving me with liters, all right? Now, if you don't, you know, if you're aware that you just simply move the decimal point over three points, three movements to the left, then that's fine. You don't have to do this step. Okay, but if you don't remember, yes, you gotta do one more step there. Now, I take the number of moles divided by the volume and that gives me molarity. And that answer is 0 0.212 moles per liter. So if I take five grams of sodium phosphate and I take 255 milliliters of solution, okay, I end up with a concentration, a mo uh, molarity of 0.12. Now in reality, most of the time is where we have these special uh, uh, containers, flasks that look like, you know, I got a long neck and they're kind of a flat round binder. But the point is that these have a mark, just one mark and they're different volumes. But this could be a 500 milliliter mark or 250, you know, or even even larger, okay? But what we do is we put the solid in here and then we, we bring up the water up to that mark, up to the bottom of this, because that, that volumetric flask is what it's called, gives us a very accurate reading as far as volume. Very rarely do we do an odd number like 255, but it's just to demonstrate, to determine the concentration how to calculate the calculation for molarity.
Okay. With that being said, uh, don't forget the assignments, okay, for this chapter. All right, there is a practice final exam on the web on the website. It's also uh, also on on uh, mod, the last module I uploaded for you, so you can find it there. Congratulations, you have completed fifteen chapters of chemistry. All right, so uh, that is the end of our chapters. Uh, the next meeting is simply again a study day for this coming Thursday, uh, which will be true for next Tuesday and the following Wednesday. The 14th is our last uh, day. Yeah, that is our final is given on the 14th of December, which is two weeks from now. Um, and so everything, if you haven't done any assignments, uh, everything, you know, they're still open. The activities and the assignments are still open. You can go back and do them. There will be a late penalty, but uh, you know, some, some points are better than nothing. Uh, on the 14th, everything shuts down. So you can't turn anything in after the 14th. And I believe, I believe it's about 11 p.m., okay? So keep that in mind if you're going to make up some, some uh, assignments. Right, let me see what else. Um, again, if for some reason the 14th doesn't work for you to take that final exam, uh, I can't go past the 14th, but I can go before. Okay, so check your work schedule, whatever schedule you have. And if you, I can bring it, you know, move it at 11th, 12th, 13th, if necessary, but I cannot go over the 14th because the grades have to be turned in, uh, I'm told, the next day or the day after. So everything has to be completed and I'm going to check everything. Okay. Um, 